Musical Hell is hitting the high seas next year. Check out the video information to find out how you can join me and the hit musical Six on the Norwegian Bliss. This episode of Musical Hell is brought to you by Midnight Musicals. Welcome to the podcast Musical Underground. And by Cafe Himbo Cookbooks, celebrating his 10th anniversary. Thank you. Maritime disasters are not exactly an unusual thing in human history. Wherever people have settled near a large body of water, they figured out ways to travel on that water, and inevitably some of those trips don't end well. But few ill-fated vessels have captured the imagination as completely or consistently as the Titanic, and it's easy to see why. Apart from the whole human hubris meets untamable nature and gets curb-stomped angle, the Titanic was nothing less than a microcosm of early 20th century society, one which suffered an apocalyptic end. And through the terror of that collapse, several examples of sacrifice, devotion, and courage have emerged, plus many more stories that we can only speculate at. So let's dig into this fertile ground for historic fiction and look into the brief, tragic history of the Royal Mail Ship Titanic. There are several musicals which have at least a partial connection to Titanic's story, but we're going to focus primarily on one, 1997's Titanic the Musical, with score by Maury Yeston and book by Peter Stone. This is because this is the musical most focused on the historic people and events attached to the sinking. The unsinkable Molly Brown features the sinking mainly as the climax of the title character's life history, and this particular breed of adaptation has been more appropriately covered by my other video endeavors. So, pun not intended, here's how it originally went down. Constructed over the course of three years, White Star's Titanic was the largest ship of the time. Unlike rival Cunard, which prided itself on speed, White Star offered its passengers greater luxury and Titanic was no exception. Even third-class cabins had modest amenities like linens and waitstaff, while first-class traveled in suites that rivaled a high-quality hotel. The safety features were also above standard. While the 20 lifeboats were not enough to hold everyone on board, it was four more than the legally required number for a ship of that size. Besides, over-the-water bulkheads were designed to keep the ship afloat in the event of a hull breach, hence the unsinkable moniker, meaning the ship itself would serve as lifeboat until help could arrive. The Titanic left Southampton on its maiden voyage April 10, 1912. Marquee names on the passenger list included John Jacob Astor IV and his new bride Madeline, mining heir Benjamin Guggenheim, Macy's co-owner Isidore Strauss and his wife of 60 years, Ida, and Denver socialite and philanthropist Margaret Tobin Brown. At the helm was Captain Edward John Smith, who'd had the honor of debuting White Star ships for the past 15 years, with other representatives from the line including managing director J. Bruce Ismay and head designer Thomas Andrews. But the majority of the passengers were immigrants traveling to America, some from as far away as Hong Kong. The first three days of the voyage went smoothly, with the ship making good time and inspiring thoughts of an early arrival. But at 11.40 p.m. on April 14th, crew member Frederick Fleet stood watch on a calm, moonless night and came to the horrible realization that the dark shape of an iceberg was looming in the ship's path. First Officer William McMaster Murdoch had the helm and attempted to swerve around the obstacle, but the Titanic scraped the side of the iceberg, popping rivets and creating long, narrow gashes all along the hull that spelled the ship's doom. See, the bulkheads were designed to work if one or two of the sealable underwater sections of the ship had been breached, but six were now compromised. And when Andrews gave the damage report shortly after midnight, he confirmed the ship was doomed. The evacuation that followed was a chaotic mess. Smith's orders were interpreted differently by various crew members who had never done a lifeboat drill on this ship. As such, they didn't know how many people the lifeboats could hold and aired on the side of caution, loading them well below their designated capacity. Passengers either didn't understand the severity of the situation or could not understand it because they didn't speak English. And the Californian, the only ship close enough to help, didn't have its radio turned on and so never received the disaster signal. After the Carpathia arrived in New York with the survivors, the full extent of the tragedy was understood. Over 1,500 people, mostly crew members, had perished in the sinking, among them Astor IV, Guggenheim, the Strausses, Smith, and Andrews. The survivors were mostly women and children, along with Ismay, more on him later, and Brown, whose efforts on behalf of survivors during and after the sinking had her taking the unsinkable crown. 
Inquiries in both Britain and America concluded that while White Star and the crew had acted according to regulations, those regulations were outdated and left far too much room for disaster. As a result, new maritime laws required sufficient lifeboats for everyone on board, regular lifeboat drills, and communication equipment manned around the clock, procedures which remain in place to this day. As is often the case with huge historic events, Yeston and Stone had to decide who among the Titanic's 2,229 passengers and crew to focus on. Some of the choices are obvious. Molly Brown had her own musical and didn't need to make an appearance in this one, and who could resist writing a tender ballad for Ida and Isidore Strauss facing death hand in hand? Others are a little more unusual, like modern widow Charlotte Cardoza who takes the name of passenger Charlotte Wardle Cardeza, but little else, as the latter was still married and traveling with her husband and young son. Most of the second and third class passenger arcs are inventions, although the names are derived from the passenger list. The romance of Kate McGowan and Jim Farrell, both named for victims of the sinking, is a case in point. But with an event this ingrained in popular culture, the main issue is often not what we know or what we imagine, so much as what we assume we know. Which brings us back to J. Bruce Ismay. If you've seen Titanic the Musical, or indeed any other pop culture retelling of the sinking, you have an image in your head of Ismay as a profit and publicity driven executive, urging Smith to dangerous speeds and fleeing the ship when things go south. A portrait as unflattering as it is almost certainly inaccurate. As mentioned, the Titanic's main selling point was not speed, but opulence. And the consensus is Ismay assisted several women and children to the lifeboats, only boarding the last one himself when it was being lowered, there was space available and nobody else nearby to take it. And while thinking the worst of corporate capitalism is usually a safe bet, this particular instance has some rather icky provenance. It seems Ismay got on the wrong side of press tycoon and actual historic garbage fire William Randolph Hearst, and while Hearst wasn't the only voice critical of Ismay after the sinking, he used every page in the Yellow Journalism playbook to fuel public perception of the White Star director as a shameless coward, slinking away from his company's tragedy like the rat he was. It worked, too. Ismay resigned from White Star in 1913 and would die a secluded and broken man. And then, to make matters worse, the Nazis got involved. The first film portrayal of Ismay as a villain was a 1943 German propaganda piece, which presented the Titanic sinking as a result of British greed and incompetence, despite the efforts of the heroic and completely fictional German officer to avert disaster. Historic accuracy aside, the portrayal of Ismay in Yeston's Titanic contributes to one of my favorite parts of the score. The Blame, a tense trio where Ismay, Captain Smith, and Thomas Andrews take turns calling each other out as the person responsible for the ship's catastrophic failure. What is not acknowledged by the characters but clear to the audience is that they all make good points. Titanic sank not from any one man's sins, but a perfect storm of human error and natural circumstance culminating in an unthinkably tragic result. The only thing missing is a witch chewing them out for their behavior.